Hello to everybody and a warm welcome to this session on LAA closure. We have a tough program. We want to show you every important aspect of this procedure, mainly focused on imaging, but also on a new interventional device, which will be the steerable sheath. My name is Christoph Hammerstingel, and I have a great panel, and I'm happy to have those outstanding experts with me. On my left-hand side, Philippe, um, who will serve as a moderator. He will help me to sort out the important question. And of course, we have Nina Wunderlich, an outstanding expert in imaging. And I think I don't have to introduce Jacqueline Saw. Um, with this panel, we can, I think, cover all important aspects of the procedure. And I think you are right here in the session. If you want to learn how imaging can support um, safety and effic efficacy of LA closure by not just during the intervention, but planning the procedure beforehand, maybe with use of a simulation system, and of course, during the procedure to cover all important aspects from transeptal puncture to sizing to device closure. And of course, it's important to, to uh, have a glimpse on new interventional um, tools like the steerable sheath, which is a very important new tool to help to make this whole procedure more precise and to increase efficacy and safety of the whole procedure. So we want to encourage you, of course, to ask every question that you have concerning LA closure or every aspect of this session. We try to answer, to cover it during this session. If it's not possible to, to cover it during the session, please feel free to, to reach out to us afterwards and we try to help you with every question that you have. Um, one important part of the session is that we will have a live course, uh, a live case from Barcelona. So it's like a, um, a case-based learning. First of all, it's my pleasure to, to introduce the patient. Um, then we will discuss aspects of this patient, of this specific case, and then we will hand over to the team in Barcelona and they will show us how to solve this situation. So, of course, what we want to do is LA uh, occlusion. But this beautiful team from Barcelona, it's my pleasure to, on their behalf, to present the patient. We have a 77-year-old male um, with some um, comorbidities, but active lifestyle, which is important for this case, of course, that he has AFib with a high thromboembolic risk with a Chetsvasco of by three. And of course, he has a significant risk of bleeding with recurrent gastrointestinal bleedings due to um, ang angiodysplasia with need of multiple transfusions in this past. And just to keep him stable at the current time, um, they had to halve the dosage of his NOAC, which of course is no effective, um, uh, no effective to avoid stroke in this situation because he has no clear indication to reduce the, do the dosage of his NOAC mm -hmm. with a normal renal function. Um, he's, he's not very old and he, uh, he has no sign of cachexia. And this is a medical treatment at the current time before the patient enters the cath lab. He's under a pixaban, simvastatin, uh, ACE inhibitor, and amurarun to keep him in sinus rhythm, which is an important aspect for the procedure. Sometimes you have patients who are still in sinus rhythm. We will discuss about this issue um, during the session, how it impacts on the procedure, on procedural planning, and his amurarone, um, obviously, to keep him under, under rhythm control. What's important, um, and this is why we are here, is the pre-procedural imaging. This patient underwent not only TE but also CT scans. I will show you the imaging, uh, the, the images within a, a few minutes. Um, he had a good left ventricular ejection fraction, and the measurements of the ostium of the left atrial appendage with TE 
uh, brings up to 19 per uh, 31 millimeters. The landing zone was measured with 18 uh, per 25 millimeters. With CT, the ostium is slightly the same, and the landing zone measured with CT scans was slightly smaller than, than measured with, uh, with TE, which is, um, in this case, um, slightly unusual because normally we measure um, bigger, bigger uh, diameters with CT when, than with, with TE. This is a normal view of the, what we have to expect during the intervention. This is a biplane view with TE, um, which just gives us an overview of the anatomy. But I would say it's not adequate to measure the size of the landing zone. We will come to that later, but it's important to exclude left atrial thrombi in this case. And this is a, a 130 degree view uh, of the same uh, uh, left atrial appendage, which um, shows that we have to deal with a chicken wing anatomy in this case. And this is how they did the three-dimensional reconstruction of the landing zone, multiplanar reconstruction with TE, measuring a landing zone of 18 by 25 millimeters, and this is, uh, this, these are the images from CT scans, and we will discuss about this later um, with a, a landing zone of 16 by 21 millimeters. And this is important, one important aspect that uh, CT scan not only gives us the possibility to measure where we want to place the device, but also to simulate the procedure before we go into the cath lab. Um, you see here a 3D reconstruction of the left atrium with the left atrial appendage, and you see the morphology of this appendage, and you see the uh, fossa ovalis, which is marked with a, uh, with a yellow ring, where you uh, have to puncture the septum to reach out to the left atrial appendage to place uh, the occluder, which will be an amulet occluder in this case, and the, the green ring represents the landing zone, and the, the blue ring marks um, the ostium of the appendage. And this is what they uh, did. They, uh, what you can do with a, a special simulation software that you try to simulate um, different device sizes, different, um, um, uh, different um, locations of the device to measure the stress and how it will uh, end up to, to close um, the appendage and the ostium. Um, and in this case, they decided to go with an AMOLED 25 millimeter, and we will see how it fits in reality this uh, simulation. So to bring this, to sum this up, we have a 77-year-old um, um, male with high risk of uh, atrial, uh, with high stroke risk within Chetswasko von 3. The indication to withheld anticoagulation is re recurrent GI bleeding. Currently he's in, in sinus rhythm and the LAA dimensions um, that we measured with CT and TE is um, in the landing zone 16 by 21 millimeters and the ostium is 19 by 31 millimeters. So this brings me up to my first questions to our great panel. Um, of course, we have CT and TE, and it is important for you to, to have a plan what would you use predominantly. And um, I think we have experts in every field here so let's start with Nina. What would you, what what are you doing in your daily clinical routine? Are you using CT in every patient or TE? Um, most likely, we use uh, the TE to really judge um, uh, the morphology of the left atrial appendage and to do the sizing. I think um, it is important to really get a good idea of the morphology. And what you can do is, if you just use 2D, just scroll through the left atrial appendage from 0 to 180 degree to really get a good idea what the morphology um, of the LA is. Um, the sizing, I would um, suggest to do it in 3D. And uh, we, we see a little discrepancy here between TE and CT, which is interesting because most likely we see a good correlation between CT and TE measurements. But it might depend maybe um, on the level. We didn't see it in CT where they really measured. So it might depend um, on the level where they're measured. Um, you just have to take into consideration if you um, use 2D imaging only, um, you, in most of the cases you will define a smaller landing zone than when you use 3D. So if you just use 2D, I would upsize maybe the device a little bit more. So this would be my suggestion. And what are you, is your opinion, Jacqueline? Um, thank you. Yeah, so, you know, uh, uh, several years ago we were routinely doing both TEE and CT pre-procedure. 
And I would say over the past three or four years or so, we just transitioned to completely just doing CT alone. I think during the COVID era, especially when it's very challenging to get baseline TE pre and post, um, you know, this is a good strategy for us. Now we're very comfortable um, in terms of correlating what we see on CT with, with, with TEE. And we and others have done um, correlative measurements, uh, comparing CT measurements and TE measurements. And as Nina has alluded to, generally CT measurements are about two to three millimeters larger than 2D TEE measurements. But when you compare the CT measurements to 3D TEE, there's less discrepancy. So I think it's very important that if you're just relying on TEE alone, that you need to be able to do the 3D measurements. For us, we're very comfortable with CT, so that's all we do. Um, but when the patient gets on the table, is anesthetized, and we get a TE probe down, we would do a measurement as well on TE on the table. Um, but you've got to make sure that the, um, the, the LA pressure is adequate as well, that the LA pressure is over 12 before you do a measurement to correlate well. Um, and so our routine now is CT only, but we would check with the TE before we, we choose the device sizing. And, and Jackie, how do you guarantee it? How do you guarantee that your um, pressure, your left atrial pressure is um, at the right level when yeah. you do the CT? Right. Also, not, so during the CT, we actually make sure that we load our patients with volume before. So we would give them usually half a liter bolus or we encourage oral intake. Um, and they're not fasting for a CT, so they're usually not a concern as, as compared to TE when you're doing it, making sure the patient has to fast. And during the procedure itself, um, once we get a transeptal puncture, you know, we check the LA pressure, make sure it's over 12, then we'll do our proper TE measurements. Yeah, very important. So we, we have to move on with the presentation of Philip, But... Uh, you while you're going to, <laughs> to upload your slides, I think it's important to keep in mind that uh, hemodynamics is very important and that you have one imaging modality what you are really relying on. I won't start by using different modalities. You must have one uh, 3D-based imaging modality that you really rely on and then you will find your right way how to treat your patients. And now I will, I'm happy that we have a really great outstanding expert on CT imaging, Philippe will show us how you can uh, accomplish this goal by using uh, CT scans. Thank you very much. Uh, these are my conflict of interest. Uh, the key objectives of this uh, uh, topic and discussion before the live case, ex ex extraordinary live case that we have from Barcelona is that LAC is a very challenging procedure, and you all know that there is no landmark of the left atrium appendage on the fluoroscopy display. And that's why the multimodal imaging is key to plan, guide, and assist the operator during the procedures. So we will see different tools uh, used from the CT uh, of the patient with valve assist too that is very useful to locate the ostium of the left atrium appendage, but also the landing zone of the closing device. And you will see that there is an overlay of these two uh, regions on the fluoroscopy display of the physician. We also have an access to a device 3D model simulation obtained from the pre-op CT of the patient. And uh, Christophe showed us uh, the different volumes that we can have with this simulation. And it will be very useful for sizing, but also simulate the final position of the device in the appendage of the patient. And finally, the combination of both, fusioning the simulated device on the fluoroscopy display, uh, will be shown during this live case transmission and is an advanced strategy to guide left atrial appendage uh, procedures. This is a, a live case that we've done five years ago in Europe PCR, and I think you can clearly see what are the advantages of fusion for the procedure. You see here in yellow uh, the, the fossa ovalis with the catheter, and you see here we have two landmarks. The yellow, the green one is the ostium of the appendage, and the purple one is the position of the lobe, and which clearly uh, fit very well with the, append the, the device, the amulet that we had implanted in this patient. One step away is the FIOP simulation, uh, which takes the different uh, um, um, parameters of the patient's left atrium appendage and the mechanical behavior of the device uh, into account, uh, predicting the, the device morphology and function after the procedure. Uh, 
There is uh, an example of a patient we have uh, done in a live case in Europe this year in 2019, and you can see here it was the 22 millimeter distal amulet that was selected, and this is here uh, the uh, imaging that we had prior to the procedure showing the device inside the appendage of the patient. And you see here the final result that we get three months after the procedure, which looks very, very similar to what we were expected to do. And finally, the combination of these two imaging strategies. You can see here the device as, as predicted by, by the simulation, which is shown on the fluoroscopic display. And you see we have a very good, really very good uh, a fitting of the device that we implant in the patient and the predicted device, as you can see here. So we have our experience with CT and fusion is a 10-year experience, and we have uh, progressively moved from valve assist to, to FAOPS, and now combining these two strategies still uh, for, for three years, and we have a very good feelings that this strategy would be the good one to help and really assist the, the physician performing this procedure. So to conclude, this is a multimodal imaging, uh, very important and useful to guide this procedure with an assist in device sizing, but also deployment and positioning uh, of the device. We have a very good uh, correlation with follow-up CT of the patients and potentially uh, improvement of the rate of better uh, occlusion of the appendage and decreased rate of peri-device leaks uh, could be an alternative to other imaging uh, techniques for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Philippe. Very impressive images. Before, just one question before we have to hand over to the colleagues in, in Barcelona. Um, if you have... Uh, as I figured out right, you have a strict plan where you want not only what you want to reach, but where you want to place the device to avoid pirate device leaks. So if you uh, could speculate, what is the additional value to have a steerable sheath in this situation? Because normally you just puncture the septum, even the puncture could be somehow sometimes difficult, and then you will end up and you have the plan where you want to place this, device, uh, this system, but you can't reach it with a standard double curve sheath. Yes, th this will be very important to discuss and to see during the live case, but uh, for sure the steerable sheath is very important to be coaxial with the left atrial appendage. And we will see that with the fusion as well, that we are uh, going inside the appendage with a coaxial, uh, a, a very good alignment of the sheath, and you can flex the, the, the sheath and go really uh, coaxial to the structure and then deploy the device at the intended position. It will be very helpful for sure. Yes, perfect. So let's give them a warm greetings from Paris to Barcelona and we will see how they will accomplish this task with all what we have already talked about. So let's be just uh, uh, say hello to Javier and his team, and Javier, the stage is yours. Hello, can you hear us? Perfectly. Perfect, we hear you. Yeah, they hear Good. So, well, we start. Good afternoon to everybody, and um, of course for the Hospital Clinic of Barcelona. We welcome you. It's uh, an absolute pleasure and a big honor to be broadcasting this case. So with any other delay, we will just um, give the word to Laura Sanchez, our echocardiographer, that it's going to start with the imaging planning of the, of the intervention. Okay, thank you. We will show some images that we want to share with you. Uh, we always start with uh, checking the pericardial effusion. And um, uh, was already show the this appendage have a distal chicken wing, but for this case we have a, one of new tool with that is the CT fusion. Uh, we already test the CT fusion in this patient. For that we will need a nice 3D image. With that we will fush the uh, already taken images from the city with the 3D echo. As you can see here, we just need some landmarks. Just put the landmarks on the echo and the landmarks on the city. And when we are fine with that, we already have the fusion and we can use it live now. Uh, 
I also want to show you some images from this uh, appendix. These are the monoplanes that they are not uh, uh, nice for to do the measurements, but they are nice to see the anatomy. So as you can see here in the first images, it looks quite nice, the appendix with not any strange morphology. But when we start here at 80 degrees, and so we start seeing in the distal part the chicken wing that was also seen in the CT scan. You can see here better in the distal part uh, with the long axis. And of course, we always try to do the measurements in 3D. So as you can see here, we like to use also the new tools of the, uh, uh, the lights uh, inside the ostium just to see the morphology. You can see here directly that it's a little bit oval. We also make, uh, uh, again, the measurements with the NPRs that we think they are really useful. You can see here the ostium, that it's the same measurements that were already shown. And we also have here the landing zone that was a little bit a uh, difference uh, in the previous measurements, but we recheck it. And as you can see here, uh, there was a problem, I'm uh, sorry, in this upper part, uh, that we have this kind of shadowing, so uh, the previous measurement was bigger than the real that one, that now was, uh, I think, 22 and 18. So uh, you can see here uh, how is the live view of the city with the, with the echo. One moment. So uh, for some cases that maybe they are difficult cases, it's nice to have it just to be sure where you are and you can relate the findings of the CT with the findings of the echo. For this case, we will have also the fusion of the CT with the fluoroscopy. Then uh, we will show also that part. And of course, we will have also the, uh, the previous simulation with the FIOPS of the, which device we are going to implant. I think that with the measurements that we have already in the CT, the ECHO, and with the simulation, we decide to go with a 25 uh, device. Mm -hmm. So, Xavi? Yeah. So we will move on with um, Ander just to the, the objectives. We can just um, show the, the yeah, presentation. Uh, the presentation, thank you. So um, thank you very much. Uh, next slide, please. So the objectives of this case are three. The first one is to, to show and discuss the assessment of the LLA human morphology with different imaging modalities and the guidance of the LAA uh, um, occlusion by 3DT and fluor CT fusion, and also to review a step-by-step -step procedural guide for the occlusion. Next one, please. So the strategy first is to minimize vascular complications doing echoguided puncture, then to do an optimal transeptal puncture, going low and posterior, then to engage in do a standard angiographic assessment to review the, the morphology, to do a device selection that this has been discussed already and to demonstrate the use of the serial device catheter to optimize coaxiality and to do a final assessment and review of the uh, device. Next one, please. So we will use uh, femoral venous axis echo-guided and transeptal puncture with a VRK needle one, uh, the insertion of the steerable catheter, and then we'll engage and do a contrast injection, and we'll confirm the size of the amplatzer amulet uh, device. Then we'll review the implanting technique, and to, finally we'll do a device assessment. So next. Good. So, with any further delay, we will start with the uh, with the case itself. So, we're gonna do it like from the scratch. So, um, actually, you know, like just the the venous access was already done, and we will just go ahead with the transectal. We like just to use a BRK one that it's a needle with you know like just a, a sharper curve, because in these cases we like to go inferior and posterior. And this extra curve, that of course you can do it you know manually if you don't have that curve, you know helps us a lot. You know, just to go to the position. As you can see now in the screen, you know, like we, we would like just to have the echo as well, the, the echo and perfect. We have like a first level of fusion with the fluoro and, uh, and the CT to help for the, for the transeptal. So at this level, the calibration is just done with the trachea. Okay? So um, in, you know, um, a green, you know, like circle, you will see, you know, like the fossa valis and actually, you know, like the, the, the optimal in theory you know, position just to approach. Don't, you know, look at the, at the appendage at this point because we will calibrate it later. This is just to guide the transeptal puncture. So as you can see, we just do the pullback 
and you'll see in the, in the X-plane, you know, of echo, that it's coming superior to inferior. And we will trust, you know, like this um, fusion, and we will just go to the point that they are actually just telling us. So here you can see that actually we're quite um, inferior and um, just quite posterior. So uh, here is better. Yeah. What do you think, Laura? No, here is better. You were too posterior at the beginning. Maybe a little. No, now it's okay. You're in the fossa. So here. Mm. So at this point, if we agree. So you can see here that you know, like I will probably, you know, just like push with a with a needle. And it's a little bit floppy, the septum. So in these cases, you know, what we like just to do, it just use a, it's just a trick, just not to push too much and just not to lose the position. Do you like the position? You, you just better, Laura, just to go more in the center. Uh, I think that if you go a little bit up, will be better yeah, because let's, let's it will just, be let's less. Just, let's let's okay. just go with a wire a little bit, you know, let's say 32. This, this is the one. We will just like go back, you know, just to this, to this position because maybe it was a little bit just lower, so just to be in a, in like in a more floppy in a more floppy part, okay, of the septum. Good. So we go back just to the cava. I think it's and a very impressive. We go back with uh, a um, with a needle. How you can show us how you can simulate it in advance. So just take your time. Yeah, it's really, it's really good, you know, and, and we have this, you know, like a little bit, you know, like of a lipomatoseptum that yeah. always makes things a little bit more complicated. But um, actually, you know, the prediction with the fluoro was really, I think, was, was excellent. So, so we will just go yeah. a little bit um, higher. Yes, take your time. We, we can see. discuss something. So I, I, don't want, I want to ask Jackie, because what would you think about this septum would be a perfect case for radio frequency puncture or not? Absolutely, Chris. Yeah. I was just uh, going to mention a little that bit I think up, this, in, for this particular Need case, I think lower. The, uh, the RF wire, the VersaCross wire, would be very beneficial. Because yeah. uh, number one, when it's, when it's through, um, moving no, it's like this, the, the RF no? would just allow the wire yeah, to puncture right across. A little bit more in And also, if you, if you are not happy with that position, now, now you don't have to remove the needle entirely. So you can just actually reposition by pulling the wire and back the and then re-advance up to the SBC to, and track up your, your um, SL1 or whatever, or VersaCross sheet will. that is. So it actually simplifies the now, procedure now as well. So, yeah. so I think uh, VersaCross RF wire would be very okay. helpful here. I will check the fusion. Christoph, I'm, I, I, would, I just want just to, to, you know, like just show this, this trick, yeah. you know, the wire. Okay. If you don't have like a transeptal needle, yeah. you know, like it's very useful just to, to have this. Yes, you have this district, dame la, la guía. So we use a coronary wire, the rigid part. No, no, the rigid part of the so coronary wire. So you're using wire. the back end of the coronary wire. The sharp Perfect. end, okay. Yeah. And, you know, like with this, just we go. In the first one, the introductor, vale? And, you know, like with this sharp end, you know, like we can actually puncture. So, Laura, where, where are we now? No, no, you, you were already in the, in the left room. Let's put, just to be sure, the other end. Yeah. Okay. And what we're gonna do at this point, just to be sure, because it was a little bit hard, and it seemed that Laura said that with the pressure, you know, like we already cross, and just we will go with the um, floppy end, just to be sure that we push everything, you know, like in a safe manner. And this, this would be, you know, like if you cannot cross, you see, you know, the, the wire, yeah. and Very now good. we are super safe, you know, to push everything, you know, and, and just avoid, 100% um, sure, you know, like just the, you see, it's, it's yeah. hard. So it's, yeah. it's good that we did this. Very good. So at this point, we ask Laura to rule out pericardial effusion. And mm -hmm. if there's no pericardial effusion, we're going to give the, the yeah, There is no pericardial effusion. 70 something kilos. So we will give 8,000 of heparin. So you give and the heparin after the, other the puncture. Thing, exactly. Yeah. Because actually, you know, like, um, of course, you know, like if it would be like a long puncture, we will give something in the middle. And now at this point, we're going to measure, as you suggest, and Jackie suggest, the pressure, zeros, zeros? Just on the chosen. Oh, but it's not good no. now. One second. I don't know if you can see the polygraph. Um, please, if you can show the polygraph. Good. Yes. So this see. would be the pressure. It's at 20 milligrams M um, scale, eh? but it's 9, 10, it's still the patient, 11. It's not so bad but a little bit dry. So now what we're gonna do, just no, just back. What we're gonna do, we're gonna go to the pulmonary vein. 
and put a stiff wire there. At this point, you know, like just what I said, that the fusion, it's, you know, at this point, it's helping a little bit, you know, because it's telling us that probably we're going to the pulmonary, I, just to the pulmonary veins. Yeah, you are already in the pulmonary but, vein. Um, you know, the tune, the nice, and the final calibration is going to be do with a contrast injection. So we will put the stiff wire here. And, you know, um, now we will advance, you know, like what we suggest, our steerable um, sheath, okay? And we will show you, um, you know, before, if you can, like, show me, or, you know, with a camera, show, you know, the tip of this catheter. This is the, the steerable sheath um, from Abbott, you know, for intended for, for amulet. And actually, you know, like just, it, this would be like the neutral position that would be the same than the usual, the, the regular one. But if under turns a little bit, you can see here that stays this curve, but at the tip, there is like an anterior movement. So this, this catheter actually, it's, it's good because it has like a hemostatic valve, so you don't need to use any, any key. So you, you also have, you know, like just a more hydrophilic coating with more stiffness, so it's impossible to have a kinking. And you have this, you know, like feature that it's the, the actually, you know, the feature that it's intended just to do f um, fine tuning, fine optimizations. So that's done just to improve coaxiality, not to make, you know, like um, big um, transeptal corrections. So it's, it's just to, to improve this coaxiality and just to have, you know, like a, a more perfect result. So at this point, we have the, the stiff wire and we're going to put it. So Monse will prepare the, the catheter with a dilator, and we will, we will just go ahead. It's also good, you know, for the septums, you know, this stiffness and this, you know, hydrophilic coating helps us, us a lot to, to cross, you know, like difficult septums like this one. So that's the thing. And after, after that, you know, like we will use a pigtail to do this final um, calibration with a, with a fusion, just to have a, a wire and then, we w we're going to be able just to put our ghost of the, of the device, of the, of the 25 um, amulet proximal, that it's a thing that, you know, like everybody agree with 3D Echo MCT and, and you know, all this baseline um, assessment. And so this is like the insertion of this 14 French catheter. It's a 14 French, the steerable catheter. It's not, there's no 12, so there's no um, selection in that sense. And the good thing that now, like, there's no exchange of catheters. We go right away or right now with this catheter that, as you can see, it enters really smoothly. It, this is like a huge improvement compared with, uh, with the previous generation. And you can see here how just we're going to this pulmonary. I mean, you see how easy, like, it just crossed? How is it cross everything? So at this point, we're going to remove the dilator and, and leave the wire. After, you know, as you can see under, it's removing the, the, the dilator. You see? Yeah. I'm holding it. Te abro. We need, there is like a, like a valve here, so we need to just not to avoid bleeding, you know, just to keep it half open. Okay, good, under. And good. And now we have, you, you see that we have this valve that it can be open and, and closed. If we're using like a small catheters, we can have it close. Of course, when we're gonna, you know, like advance the, the device itself, it will, be, it, will be, it will be open, okay? So now, you know, we go with, uh, with this pigtail with markers, just to go to the, uh, to the appendage. Laura, and of course, you know, like just uh, this, this um, fusion, you know, will help us. And Laura? Yeah. So can you show you know, like just the tip of, of the catheter. Yeah, you are already inside the pulmonary vein. So and now with the bubbles, it's more difficult back. to see. Okay. If you can just... Okay, good. There are so many bubbles, Xavi. Quita la fusión. Que no. Como la normal. Can you just put the regular... Okay, good. 
You are in and the neutral position with the steerable ship. We are or? now we are now in the in the in the neutral position. So we also like just to have a wire inside. You know, like the the you see that now we are with a pigtail inside, no Laura? Yeah, you are so, and we are advancing. We could at this point, you know, just give some curve, you see? How nice, you know, with a steerable cather. Yeah, and you know, good. like don't look at you know like the, the simulation because now we will we will you know just do the, the the proper you know calibration of the shape. So let's let me advance a little bit more in the appendage, and now we go just to the RAO. This is something very nice from FIOPS as well. So FIOPS provided the optimal, you know, like just um, probably I think that you have it in the screen, the optimal view that it's a 25 um, RAO without crania, without caudal. That would be, you know, like the, the the best projection. And at this point, you know, I'm gonna go. As you can see that here, it's it's it really fits a little bit. So we're gonna inject contrast from from the pigtail. Just one thing, very important to see how the pigtail is moving because the patient is in sinus rhythm, so it makes it yeah, yeah. good to see that this it's is um, Christoph, like yeah, a very good point because. Yeah, I don't know your impression, but you know, like um, honestly, um, you know, for me, you know, patients in sinus rhythm are, mu are much more difficult. So if you can feel it, yeah. so feel, feel a full quality of, you know, like the. the one second, okay. Yeah, it must plus. Okay, so do, we're gonna do this, you know, like injection of the appendage, and after, you know, like. The, so you do it for measurement or for calibration? No, this is just this is just for 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 calibration. Yeah. See that it needs to be turned and and you know like now, you know, and um, this is actually the, the the final tuning. We can just like even move back a little bit, and we're gonna repeat it because I think that now it's just nicer like this. We're we're repeating this like the creatinine was normal. Okay, can we? Uh -huh. Okay, good. You see here we see more the ostium. And actually, you know, like this is important and um, it's just a temptation to change the plan with the angel, with even, you know, like sometimes with a, with a 3D echo, you know, while you're doing the case or with the eyes or with the micro. I think that it's important that, you know, for fluid, for, you know, for size, if you have a plan, you know, stick to the plan. And actually in this case, um, if you remember, the ostium was, um, had a, a larger um, diameter, a maximum diameter of 31. So it's true that maybe 25 could seem a little bit large, but I think that um, we need to try the, sorry, the 22 would, no, the 25 would seem a little bit um, large for this um, landing zone, but we need that disc. If we just uh, step down to 22, you know, the disc, it's not gonna be enough to cover this 31 um, millimeter ostium. So without any further delay, I think that, you know, like the fusion, they, they've been calibrating. So just test, I mean, see if it's a little bit more. I think that it's good. So now um, they're gonna put, you know, like the, the amulet that FIOPS provided for us, the 25, in the screen. So you see it. So and actually from here you can move, you know, just to more you know, like cranial or caudal, like something like this, I think that it's gonna be, it's gonna be good. You'll see that probably, you know, after we form the ball, we will need just to do some counter clock and probably some rotation with a cather that it's gonna be so nice, like something like that. But I think that we're ready to, to go, to advance. So, and we, we have the, the device already prepared. We, it's very nice because, you know, like we took the, the injections and now we remove the pigtail and we already, you know, like inside the appendage. So while you are changing the device, Philip, how do you think, how predictive is everything? No, we're not statistic? changing, we're using the 25, eh? Yeah, yeah I, I know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because we are discussing because about changing plans during the procedure, this, to my opinion, should not happen. So what, to your ex uh, okay. experience, how predictable is everything with, uh, with pre-planning? No, th this is the, 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 the main interest of, of pre-planning is that you, you do not have to change anything. You don't yeah. have to change the device, don't have to change your plan. Uh, and we have a lot of tools today uh, with Eco, with CT and Fusion to, to, to do the right, the right strategy and have the, the, the perfect result. Um, the, 
the comment I have about the, the, the model simulated on the fusion, do you think it's at the right, at the proper position, uh, I mean the calibration, reg registration of the CT on the, on the fluoroscopy should be, should possibly be a little bit uh, more on the top and the, and the right of the screen because we see that the, the, the deliver sheath is, uh, is uh, more superior to the, to the appendage and the, and the device. What do you think? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Just a question. Do you think the registration, the calibration of the CT fusion is, is adequate or, or we should maybe a little bit push it up uh, because we see the device is... Uh, is uh, yeah, so we have like our exactly technician, if you can push it the, up a little bit. I think that maybe it's like this exactly fine fine tuning a little bit like that. It was not. I think that this this is okay. Yeah. And will you change the angulation of the steerable sheath, uh, considering yeah. this uh, this projection that we have now and the coaxiality okay. of the sheath on the appendage? Yeah. So this is something that I, I would like just to show um, a little bit. You know, like um, live. You know how how this works. So um, actually, we have like everything set here. We have like our 25, and we will just advance, you know, up to the tip, and you know, as you know, like form, you know, the ball. That it's you know, like you hold the cable just to be a traumatic, and then you pull back the the sheath. At this point, you know, like with Laura, we checked that the, the position probably it's nice. It's kind of proximal, but I think that it's not good. It's good. And, you know, we can just do this usual counterclock rotation. That, in this case, would be not enough. You know, I would have just to do a lot. So since we have like this, this um, nice feature with a, with a steerable catheter, I think that it's good that we try to straighten a little bit the catheter. You see how nice? Yeah, perfect. And you see in the screen? Impressive, yes. And yeah. actually, just to me, um, for this fine tuning, this, this tool is really, really useful. So if you agree, I will start like from this, from this point, pushing, you know, like really slow. I like just to go really slow with this, just to give, you know, like just to the hooks, you know, just time and space and everything, you know, just to um, engage, you know, like nicely, you know, the walls of the, of the appendage. Now you see that it it's needs more counterclock, <laughs> yeah. you see? This, this is not a good position, so I recapture. And I will actually use even more, you know, this steerable, you know, like, um, feature, you know? Like more counterclock, more anterior, and just... I want to answer that. That's good. It's very good you to see, see how, how uh, well controlled everything is. Yeah. And you might have to also go a bit deeper there, Chevy. Mm. Yeah, yeah I think we, we will go a little bit deeper because otherwise, you know, like it's yeah. going yeah, yeah, no, yeah. outside, exactly. So what, what you can But nice it's like really... It's yeah, what we can nicely Sorry? see here is uh, the posterior part is of major importance on the right, uh, on the right hand of the TA image. Yeah. So it's very important to look at the posterior part, which was really nicely demonstrated here, um, that the device slipped through the posterior rim into the left atrium. And, and, uh, and yeah, if you can see here, and you want to go a little bit more deeper, we go back, you know, just to the, to the position, and then we push without any, you know, like fear that we're like... Um, actually, you know, interfering with, with everything. So what I was just telling that, you know, the 25, you know, in this sign of rhythm, you know, might be, you know, like a little bit challenging, but we need to try to push and, and, and try just to, to improve, you know, like the, the position. It's okay. turning all the time, but now it's, you know, like it's um, a more distal position, yeah. wouldn't be this proximal part. But um, in this case, I would like just to see, you know, because I think that the lobe, it's nicely open. Um, and well engaged, I would like just to see, yeah. you know, if we can, you know, keep on, you know, like with this, in this position and see, you know, like if we cover everything. Yeah. And actually, um, you know, like we have like a second simulation, FIOPS, it's nice because um, they give you, you know, like the, the Amulet 25 proximal, the Amulet 25 distal, so you have different options. I think that we try just to be in this proximal position and, and to have, you know, this ghost, this simulation, that it's the actual position, that the optimal position was not that easy. 
So just to avoid manipulation, and as Jackie said, it's good just to go a little bit more distal. And I think that in this position, we can be more than happy that, that it's stable. So can you just please um, remove the ghost of the, of the amulet? So um, now we're going we're gonna, to um, focus on the stability signs. OK, and we're going to pull back a little bit. It's, it's true that, you know, like in, on the lower part, um, I'm not sure if we're good. But le let's see. No, no, it's no, not good. It's not good. It's not good. You see, eh? Yeah. It's, it's, so it's, we're going to go again, back. So this is live, eh, Laura? Yeah, yeah, it's live all good. the time. And we're going to just try to change the position. If you see, you know, it's happening all the time the same, that it's, you know, like just going out. So I'm going to go a little bit more distal, just to be sure. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you have like any other suggestion or, or just uh, you would try just to be more proximal and just try to force a little bit, you know, like just the... Yeah. Right, I think that this is better. It's, yeah, yeah it's definitely deeper now. In a 135 view, though, this it is still much better. shows this is much better. tilted. This is much better, and even you know, like with the with the with the simulation, it's much better. The the lobe, it's really nice compress. And can you just if you can just remove the, the the amulet because it's in a different position? What do you think, Laura? Yeah, I think it, I think it's okay. I'm, so for for you know, like the amulet, we have like five signs of stability. It's an acromion close, so we need to see that it's inside the circumflex, uh, the the lobe. See. L, the orientation looks good. O, so sorry, the, L, the lobe compression. O, orientation. S, separation between lobe and disc. And finally, like the E of the ellipticity of the disc. So I'm going to do, a, you see, like this stability test, like slightly back. You see that it seems that the lobe, it's not moving at all. But I, I would like just to, to see with Laura, if you can just um, confirm yeah. that we didn't have like any movement. No, no, it's the same. It's the same. So can we just like maybe, you know, like without the fusion show, you know, like a larger yeah, yeah. picture because they see various. You see that it's clearly inside the circumflex. Yeah, and it's also not touching well the mitral valve, so we are safe. So do you agree that it's a good point to yeah, release yeah, yeah. the device? We're covering, fully covering without yeah. leaks, you know, like the, the ostium. So 25 was good in this sense. Of course, yeah. And I think, so what do you think? You know, like, sh should we... Just so what? What, release I, it? what I normally do, I think I don't think we have time. I wait f just five minutes, to discuss something with my colleagues in the cast lab, and yeah. do the echo after five minutes, and I, I look if it still stays in, in the same place. Well, we can wait a little bit, you know, just but <laughs> it, it's, it doesn't look that it's moving, eh? So we can discuss anything. Just to so make we can just do, you know, just to speed up this operation, just to do again this, you know, like um, stability test. Laura, it's not moving, eh? No. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna release it. Would you like to inject in the sheath? No, no, no. At this point, you know, I think that um, we're we're good. You know, like. So it didn't move, eh, Laura? No. Good. Can see here also. Yes, I. I perfect. Very good. good. You see yeah, the separation so. between Super the disc nice. and the lobe. Very good. Yeah. Yeah, it's like very proximal and, and actually it's, it's nice. And if you can just check, you know, like the 3D, yeah. that there's no leak or there's nothing. So you think that it's... No, it was already super nice. You can see good. also the, the so shape I, of an 8. I don't know. Well, you see that you, there's no leak at all. And yeah. we're covering the pulmonary ridge. Is it important? I think that with, uh, with this low open disc, you know, devices, that the disc makes a full coverage. So we're gonna. Um, so first of all, do we have time to show you know, like the vascular you. closure, or we don't have time? <laughs> Very nice presentation. And Christoph, do we have time? Yes, we have ten minutes. So if there's anything you want to tell us. <laughs> no, well, you know, like I, I can show you, you know, like the figure of eight that it's like, if you can just like. You can like use a well, we can you know, also like for no. vascular so we can closure. Yeah. So, no? Yes. You can use like a proglide or you know like a, a dedicated device, or you can do this. You know that it's a little bit cheaper with a suture. If you can like um, you know. 
Yeah, it's just the Venus exactly. puncture, of course. Focus my, so my hands, so this is like what we call the figure of eight. So we go into the skin, and actually the, the principle is not suturing the vein, it's just suturing, you know, like the subcutaneous tissue in order, you know, just to make a compression of the, you know, tissue and, and just to, to, to have this, you know, like nice... So, Chevy, where were you of doing the, of that? The um, I noticed you didn't do a final cine angiogram. Are you really no. confident with fusion imaging so you don't routinely do a, a final shot? Contrast well, injection? Well, um, um, we, we um, with the fusion, well, of course, we, we're starting. I think, you know, the, the, the fusion was good. But especially if we have, like, a 3D echo with the quality, like the one that we have, and that there's no color Doppler and there's nothing, I think that that's, you know, like enough just to save this, I don't know, like 15 millimeters of contrast. That I don't think that they're not going to, you know, like provide any additional or relevant information. So we're super happy, you know, if we have like this high quality um, echo. So at this point, we have this eight, so that's why we call the figure of eight. And under now, you see that it's bleeding from, you know, like the skin, so probably the ACT is really high. And we're going to pull back the sheath. We just like put it straight, and as you can see here, just espera un momentito. There's no no bleeding. Okay, so under holes with a finger. We always, you know, like just put a compression on it over it, just to make sure that the patient is not gonna move the 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 leg. But as you can see here, it's like really really nice. If it doesn't work, you know, we always put a second a second a second you know line. It's bleeding a little bit, so we'll compress a little bit, but just not so bad. And they always ask, the anesthesiologist always ask us if we want to revert heparin. In this case, in the ETAVI, of course, we say yes. In this case, we always say no, because I think that it's good for the device, you know, just to be, you know, like when you insert the device to have some heparin in the, in the body. So we don't really concern about this, because it's just one minute of compression, and actually, yeah, it's not bleeding anymore, so it's good. Very good. So we have some questions we want to discuss, so, but not enough time. Um, once again, um, very great job that you have done. And I think I, what, what we have to, to focus on is that the, pre, that the imaging that we've done, that you've done pre-procedural is not to make the procedure more complicated, but to make it easy in the cath lab and to do the work before you go into the cath lab and maybe then the control after the procedure. But you, you see, I think you have seen impressively that it makes life much easier because you are really know what you're expecting from your patient who is who's on, uh, on the table. What do you think, uh, Nina? Um, I think we could really nicely see that the steerable sheets really helped in the situation because uh, you had trouble at the beginning to really capture the posterior part of the um, of the landing zone. And this worked finally by uh, talking a little bit to the anterior and going a little bit deeper. So you could really manage it nicely by a small deterioration of the sheath. That was, was really impressive to see. That uh, it really makes a big difference if you just have a little bit of tournament and a little bit um, deeper positioning of the sheath. Yeah, I think to yeah, your pre-imaging is, is absolutely key here in this case. And as you've alluded to earlier, you know, between choosing a 22 and a 25, even though Fiopsh gave you both the options, but knowing the orifice measurement that was up to 31, um, I think swayed you to pick the 25, which is, I think, is the absolute right thing to do because otherwise you might have the orifice not entirely covered. So imaging was very helpful for that. And then the other part with a steerable sheath is, I think if you have a very straightforward you know, appendage, like a windsock, you know, you, you probably won't need a steerable sheath. But in this particular case where you have a retroflex chicken wing anatomy and or cases where you have early bifurcation, trabeculation sticking out, and you want, you know, precise positioning of your lobe, steerable sheath is very helpful uh, in that example. So I think for your case, you highlighted very well that simple counterclock of deflection allows you to point slightly more superior. I think that helps you um, obtain uh, a good apposition of your lobe. So good job there. And maybe Thank a question, you. Xavier, from, uh, from the chat here. So um, here is something, somebody who wants to know what are the benefits and the risk if you use a coronary wire uh, during your transeptal puncture approach? 
Exactly. So, I mean, of course, as you said, like in this case, like a radio frequency wire, it's easier, you know, like probably, probably safer. But the thing is that sometimes, you know, like if you put the finger in the transeptal needle, it's not so sharp. So um, for those floppy septums that are getting really close to the posterior wall of the, of the atrium, just to do this like movement, like very short movement with a sharp end, you know, it pokes, it creates this orifice, you know, like in the septum, that then after, you know, you invert the wire, you put the floppy part as we did, and then you have this control and this very safe um, um, procedure or transeptal. We're not doing it routinely. It's just, when you're just trying to do the, the normal, like the one that we did, like the normal transeptal, and for some reason, because it's floppy, because it's stiff, for some reason, like it's not crossing like easily. But it's a, it's a very thing, a easy thing, like um, cheap and, and, and very safe, I think. Thank you, Xavi. The, the transeptal function is, is really key for the procedure because as you've seen during the live, it's really important to be very correct with the appendage. And we have some uh, a variety of anatomies in, in different patients. And, and there is a question about would you uh, uh, well, with the, the, the pictures and the, the imaging of the patient we have, would you have uh, punctured the, the, the septum differently and, and possibly avoid the use of the steerable sheath? What is your opinion on that? No, I mean, I think that um, actually Lyra showed, like with this lipomotor septum, sometimes you are a little bit forced, but I think that we were like really low and, and, and posterior. So I think that that it's it was like a, the right position, but the, the the anatomy of the of the appendage was the was the challenge, and actually you know like we need to do the, all these retroflex. So um, um, I would like just to have this final slide about the team because uh, if you can like show you know like the the team that we work to, to all today like Ander and me and Laura, but we we'll also have like Monse and 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 Rosa. Maria Jose Carretero um, and more just nurses and Omar. So thank you very much. Um, I think that we're running out of time. It's been a real pleasure and I hope that it was like um, useful and, and you, you got all these teaching points that we like just to transmit. Thank you very much. It was very impressive and a great presentation of this case. Congrats once again and thank to you. your whole team. So I hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. So we have just three minutes left. So any comments from the panel about uh, the case or the what, what we've seen today? Philip? One wonderful demonstration, yeah. you know, with fusion imaging as well and all the pre-planning tools. And um, I mean, one of the questions that we would probably get is, do you need all these tools available? Yeah. It's great that you have. And, and you know, we're yeah. fortunate that a lot of times we have um, all these uh, availability. But what is the bare minimum? Yeah, <laughs> that's important. I, once again, I, I want to emphasize I would not want to make it too complicated. So I, I'm, for, for my side, I'm, I'm very comfortable with echo alone, sometimes CT scans, but I, I think everybody has to figure it out on its own concerning availabilities and so on. Philip. Yeah, I think we don't need all, but we need something. As we said at the beginning of the session, we don't have any landmark for, for the appendage. So we, we, it's not like for TAVI, we have the calcification. We don't need anything, just fluoro and the balloon, and, and that's it. We need something. We need something in, which, in what we trust, something that we can use, uh, uh, and we know really where to, to, how to do to have the, the proper position of the device. And, uh, and um, really, it's like for many techniques, you, you have to use the one that you know the best. Uh, and in my opinion, the CT has really advantages over the, the eco. I, I, I trust eco as well, but we have different, you know, for the structural interventions, we have different um, informations from CT. And this fusion technique is really important because it provides uh, the, the, the opportunity to have the device in the patient prior to the procedure. You can see how the, the device behaves. You can see if you have a uh, possibility of covering the ostium of peridivice leaks. And we have possible very important information uh, from these techniques. However, uh, whether it translates into benefit for the patient in terms of outcomes is still needs to be demonstrated. And we don't have this data. Uh, I mean, I completely agree. So um, I rely mainly on uh, TE as well, as uh, Christoph said. But um, 
I think it's very important to, um, especially for the for the people who start a program, uh, to really get some help with uh, um, anatomical landmarks, and it can be really helpful with uh, the aquafusion. And as the, uh, the the fusion of the different imaging modalities, and um, another point is, I think we we really want to avoid many um, angiogram angiographies because we know we might have um, silent microemboli in the brain. So we really try to avoid that. And if any imaging modality can help to achieve that, to really minimize the amount of injections we are doing into the left atrial appendage, uh, we are on the good way if we use um, these imaging modalities. So this uh, brings me up to the closing remarks. I think uh, we gave a great summary on how procedural and pre-procedural imaging with advanced tool can help um, to plan the procedure and to accomplish the goal. Um, either, either it's a CT scan or 3DT, I think the, the um, uh, main, most important aspect is that it is, that it is 3D. And I think we could show you impressively during the case um, the use and um, of uh, steerable sheaths to accomplish um, the goal to implant the occluder precisely within the left atrial appendage. And yes, I hope to see you all again in the next years, maybe as implanters, and we will be happy um, to, to, to find out how the, the journey goes on with, the, uh, with LAA occlusion. And I want to thank the great panel that I had with Jackie, Nina, and Philip. And I wish you all a great Congress during the last uh, one day. Thank you very much.